We're on the series of prayer and we're up to number two today. And this is ask and it will be given to you. Now I'm reading from Matthew chapter seven, verses seven to eight. This is where Jesus gave a very important prayer promise, one that reveals our father's heart. I think this is almost more about him than it is about us. Listen to this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Let's pray about this. Father, today we want to understand your heart. We want to understand why this promise is there, why it's important, what it reveals to us about prayer, but also what it reveals about you. We're asking for your spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, that we might know what this is, what it's about, how we can apply it, and how it makes us understand who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's not hard to understand this prayer promise from Jesus. Ask and it will be given to you. It's awesome. I love it. Very simple, very straightforward, and it's revealing Father's heart. Let's read on a bit with this now. We're reading now verses 9 to 11, where Jesus went on to explain it like this. He said, Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, Jesus is saying, your Father. He talks in this story about fathers giving something to their son. So it is about us having God as our Father, so we can kind of assume that this is basically about born-again people praying to God their Father. Amen? Now, when a child asks his loving Father, who is definitely not evil, who is favorably disposed to his child, he or she will get a response. Because in this story, even the Father who is not good will respond to his child. If the child asks, it brings out a response. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand initially, that when we ask Father, he loves us. He is a good Father. He's favorably disposed towards us, and he wants to answer yes. Now, of course, God is love, so he doesn't want to answer yes to things if we're asking for something that's not good for us and other people and him. If we're asking for something that will hurt other people, he's not inclined to answer yes for that. However, this is still a promise. Then when Jesus has taught this about the father who gives good things to his son, he then moves on and says a remarkable statement. Again, he starts with the word therefore in verse 12. So let's recap a little bit. All right. So in verse seven to eight, ask and it will be given to you. Everyone who asks receives. He says, a son asks his father for a fish, will he give him a stone, etc. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, now what do you think it would say? It should say, therefore, ask him. But it doesn't. It says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Amazing. It almost sounds like a change of topic, but it cannot be because Jesus connects it with the word therefore. It is the same topic. Verse 12 is there because the previous verses give the reason for this. So whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, is built upon the fact that God gives to those who ask him. So if the conclusion is this doing unto others what you want them to do unto you, and it comes out of God giving to those who ask him, 
it must be true, it simply has to be true, that God answering prayer is also because God wants men to do to him what he's doing for them. This is based on the law of sowing and reaping, which God perfectly well understands. He is the one who created it. Now, let's think about this. You ask God for something, he gives it because he's doing unto others what he wants them to do unto him. That's just the grammar and the logic of this statement, as well as that he gives because he's the loving father and because he's good and because asking requires a response. Giving is love. He wants to give. He wants to initiate giving because God loves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants to give. God is a giver. He is love. He gives. Love gives. And God is wise. He sows what he wants to reap. You ask him and he wants to say yes. He wants to give. You know, as I said, as long as it's not going to hurt other people, etc. God gives because you're his son. He wants to lavish good things. But at the same time, he's hoping to reap the same thing. When he asks us, I'm sure he wants us to give to him. He wants us to say yes to him when he asks us to do things, etc. God is very smart. He's very wise. And that's also what this passage is teaching us. Then Jesus went on to say this. I'll read verse 12 again. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, sometimes known as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if this is the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets is based on doing unto others what you want them to do unto you, and later on, Jesus explained that love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on this hang all the law and the prophet. So all the law and prophets are based and hang on love, but they're also formulated on the idea of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Again, if both of those things equal the Old Testament law and prophets, then both those things equal each other. Amen. It's just a bit of mathematics there, a bit of logic. Amen. A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. Simple. So doing unto others as you want them to do unto you is love. God is love. And he wants us to realize that this is also motivating him to answer affirmatively when we pray. God knows he will reap what he's sowing. Therefore, he wants to sow things that he wants to reap. So he wants to sow giving. Amen. It's simple. Galatians 6, 7 it goes like this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. God wants you to understand this law and to live by it like he does. Amen. In effect, Jesus said, Ask Father, he will answer generously, not only because he loves you as his child, but because he wants people to respond affirmatively and generously when he asks them for something. He wants to reap what he sows, and no one in the universe understands the law of sowing and reaping like he does. Amen. Now, another thing that Jesus brought out in this scripture that says, Ask and it will be given to you, is the asking of persistence. Now, he said, don't be like the heathen who think they are heard because of their many repetitions. Fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, touch me, touch me, touch me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. God knows what you have need of before you ask him. That doesn't mean all your prayers have to be quiet. If you're praying from the passion of your heart, they are not going to be quiet. Amen. They could be loud. That's why sometimes we shake our fists. We're not shaking our fists in the face of God. We're just strong with passion, overwhelming desire to see this. You know, when people go out to watch the footy, 
they get excited and passionate. It's because of the passion of their heart. It's definitely not an eternal objective, amen. But the desire of our heart in God is eternal and it is worthwhile and it is worth getting passionate about, amen. Now, this is what the Bible says in the Amplified Version of Matthew 7, 7. Ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. You know, knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking. There's a sense of repetition here that Jesus illustrated with the widow coming to the unjust judge. And he didn't give judgment in her favour because it was the just thing to do. He gave judgment in her favour because she wearied him with her continual coming. Her continual coming was evidence that she knew that what she was asking was just, was right, and that she should have it. Amen. Now, this is the same as what God's looking for with us, because Jesus said at the conclusion of his story about the unjust judge, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he returns? Faith in that story is depicted as ask and keep on asking. It's the keep on asking of I know that this is right. I know that God's for this. I know it's just and I know it's the desire of my heart. And this is what I've been put on this planet for. Amen. If we keep on asking, keep on coming. Now, of course, God heard you the first time. You don't have to repeat it the first time a thousand times. You praise God for it. You restate it. You speak to mountains. You do whatever you can. You bind up the devil and you can say, God, this is what I really want. Father, I have a dream. And you know, I know that I respond to dreams. I respond to vision. When I was younger working on the farm, my father would speak to me like this. He said, Dave, well, i got a great idea. We're going to change the yard. The cows wait in before they come into the milking shed. And we're going to put this gate that moves behind the cows so they can't all run away all the time. I saw the vision for it. And I wanted to help him build it with everything in me. I wanted to do that because I caught the vision. And then my mum would say something like this. Why don't you boys ever do anything for me? I keep telling you to mow the lawn. And we didn't seem to respond the same way because it wasn't vision. If she had to come out and she said, I have a vision that when I walk outside this house, the lawns are perfect. The birds are in the trees. Everything's tidy. Everything's put away. And I just enjoy myself in the garden. Now, being a teenage boy, I might not have taken that much notice, but that would have imparted a vision. And I respond to vision. And God told us, write the vision, make it plain. He responds to vision the same as he wants us to respond to vision. He puts a vision in our life, a vision before us. All leaders are supposed to be casting vision. And so when we come to God with a vision, Father, I have a vision to build a great church. Father, I have a vision to build a great family. I want to build a family and a home where everybody has a room, where everything has a place and is in its place, where the children can grow up in the atmosphere of God, where we can have meals together, where we can invite friends, where we can have a great life together. I have a vision to take them on holidays. I have a vision that they'll enjoy this and they'll understand and God's goodness. I have a vision that they'll see prayers answered. If you come to God speaking out of a desire, that's a vision. I'm sure he'll catch that vision and he'll want with all of his want for you to fulfill that vision. He sees it. It's a godly vision. It's a good vision. And you might say, I have a vision to build a business, a business that's founded upon integrity, that's founded upon trust, that's founded upon keeping our word. It's founded upon blessing people with great provision. It's going to bless our business partners, those we do business with, and it's going to bring provision home for the families of those who work in it. I have a vision for a great business in Jesus' name, a business that's going to be an example to all others, that you don't have to cheat, you don't have to lie, you don't have to cheat on your taxes, but you can trust God. You can trust God and have Him give you favour and bring customers and open doors for you and give you creative ideas. I have a dream for a great business. And if you pray this before God every day and you declare the vision, you write the vision and make it plain, you bring others around that vision, God 
God will be in the center of that vision and he will enable you to bring it to pass. He will move and bring the favor. He will do the supernatural and even put supernatural upon your natural and enable you to go beyond anything you've done before and to become the person needed to fulfill that vision. Maybe you got the vision for a great church, a growing church, for a whole town to be saved. Speak the vision before God. Declare the vision. Say it out loud. Say it passionately and on fire and you will see that God will be in that. He loves vision. He loves to hear the desire of your heart, not just to pray out of the mental ideas that we've formulated through man's theology. You know, like you could pray, omnipotent father. And I'm not saying this to put anybody down. Omnipotent Father who reigneth transcendent over the universe, I would of thy clemency that you would bestow upon me one mercy drop and enable me just to get by in life so I don't have to steal. You could pray that, but pray out of the passion of your heart. There's nothing wrong with wanting to live in the abundance that God has placed on this earth for his family. Amen. There's nothing wrong with wanting it like Esther. If it's for noble purposes, it's not hurting anybody else and it's blessing everybody you can and it overflows in blessing for others. Dream the dream. See the vision. Remember God said in the last day, says God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The old men will dream dreams. The young men will see visions. And on my handmaidens and on my servants, I'll pray out in those days of my spirit. They will prophesy and I will show. One is in heaven above and signs on the earth beneath. Vision and dream is part of this. God's giving you the desire of your heart and he's wanting you to bring it back to him every day. Bring it back to him on your knees. Bring it back to him in your confessions. Bring it back to him in prayer and bring it back to him in your singing, in your worship. Keep it before God. Write it down and believe that God will fulfill the desires of your heart. Maybe your dream is to see all of your grandchildren coming to Christ and serving him, seeing the children growing in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, seeing all of these children and grandchildren finding the right marriage partners, being part of great churches, building great churches. What is your dream? What is the passion of your heart? What is it that stirs you and stirs you? Why are you even here? What do you exist to see happen? Part of my vision is to see my wife happy, to see her contented, to see her full of joy, to see her provided for and able to fulfill the desire of her heart and to express who she is. And I've tried my best over the years to allow her to express who she is and not try to conform her to some other image, even if it's different to what everybody else is like. It doesn't matter. God made each one of us unique. And so we do what we can. Amen. So we do what he created us to do and to be. So today, if you haven't yet given your life to Jesus, his desire is for you to become one of his children through being born into his family. Yes, I know it doesn't make sense. We were born into this world with the parents, but Jesus spoke about being born again, being born again spiritually, becoming a new creation on the inside, a new person, and when he is born, this new person is born into God's family and he is one of God's children from that second onward. To make this happen, Jesus gave up his life on the earth. He allowed the evil people to crucify him, but because he was perfectly sinless, they couldn't crucify him for what he had done wrong. And so he enabled himself to be crucified, punished, whipped, spending time in hell because of what I've done wrong and you've done wrong. He did it for us. Yes, it might be a big step to admit we've done things wrong, unloving, unkind, hurtful, selfish. But if we will admit it today, then we can see that Jesus paid all the consequences of what we've done wrong. And those consequences were severe. The Bible talks about the fire of judgment, the fire of hell, and the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of God. We all have to be judged on what we've done in this life. And so if we don't accept Jesus' sacrifice, we have to face that judgment on our own merit 
and you better be hoping you've done nothing wrong so you can get through. But I'm assured by the word of God that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The good news is that Jesus paid for you. And so if you put your trust in him, receive his new birth today, you can, then you become his child and the past is completely expunged, quashed, washed away and annihilated. It's gone. None of the things you've done up to this second will count in eternal judgment. If you accept Jesus and his sacrifice today, receive his new birth and then begin to walk with him as Lord. This is available to you right now because of what Jesus has done by simply asking, praying and repenting. To make this perfectly simple, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now and if you pray this prayer to God and say it sincerely with all your heart, believing you receive today, then this will be yours. Your name will be in the Lamb's Book of Life and you'll be a part of God's family, able to ask your Heavenly Father in the way I've been describing. Simply pray this prayer after me right now. Say, Jesus, now you say that, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. Today, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you paid for my sin, that you died, that you went to hell, but that you rose again, proving it's forgiven. I receive you as my saviour, I confess that you are now my Lord and I will follow you from this day forward. I receive your new birth. I'm born again and my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life and I am God's very own child. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer and really meant it, and if you weren't sure, of course, you can always rewind a bit and say the prayer along with me. But if you really meant it today, then your name has been recorded as God's child. You've disappeared out of the devil's world system and you're in God's kingdom. And you're safe. You're safe from eternal judgment as long as you keep confessing Jesus is Lord. Keep following him. To help with this, you read your Bible every day. You pray to God every day. And if you do something wrong, you go straight to God and ask him to forgive you. Because he said in his word, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening today. Let's remember to keep praying what we desire in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you in the next video.